Hello, everybody. Welcome to Green Vibes Podcast. And we are back. Right, Erica? Yes. With a lo long time. Yeah, yeah, actually, it's a long time. It's almost a year that we recorded our last episode. And uh, But uh, we have a lot of surprise for this year for you guys, for you about the environment. We are continuing to talk about environment, sustainable thing. And uh, now this year we are starting doing with mental health, right? Health. Mental, uh, so about the health. Health. Yeah, health. let's be health. Yeah. It's not for people that want to lose weight, right? No. Or something like this, no? <laughs> we are not asking everybody to eat salad, which is health, right? But that's not our purpose here. That's what you want, right? And uh, we are going to start over again with our podcast so people can listen, can uh, see on our YouTube channel or Spotify. So we are ready there for you guys to watch it and listen anytime you want. Okay. And uh, talk about health. Do you know what is GMO? GMO. Okay. For me as a pharmacist, I'm going to say it's a good manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> I know GMP. That's a good manufacturer practice, right? But okay, no, that's not really related with pharmacy. Actually, no, I don't. I can, we can see that many foods has some labels that say GMO free, but uh, I don't know what is this, but I have the answer. We say, say. <laughs> <laughs> we have the answer here. So we are here today with some people that specialist in GMO. So she's professional on this and she's going to explain us what is this? We are here today with Rachel Partner. Hi, Rachel. How are you? Hey, thank you guys for having me. And I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I would say that I have done a lot of research and my lived experience has definitely taught me a lot about our food system and mm -hmm. how it's really impacting all of us and our environment. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here to chat about it. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's our pleasure here. So maybe let's start with it. Let's start to say for everybody, what is GMO, right? I know that's not good manufacturer, <laughs> right, for pharmacy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just explain us what is GMO that we see, right, in so many foods that some like, has the labels, some of they don't. Mm -hmm. So give me some explanation about this. Actually. Absolutely. So they're, GMOs are genetically modified organisms. Uh, it's where they take DNA from one species and they insert it into another one to introduce a new trait. So it sounds complicated, but I'll break it down. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's mainly used in uh, corn, soy, canola, sugar, um, sugar beet, and that's created sugar. Um, and what they do is there's there's two main types of GMOs in the at the moment, and I find mm. that's the easiest way to sort of explain what a GMO is. The, one of the main types is pesticide producing. So they actually insert DNA that's a toxin directly, let's say, into the corn. And that way, when the corn grows and a bug eats it, its stomach will be filled with ulcers and it'll die. On the other hand, there's herbicide resistance. So they engineer this plant hmm. to be resistant to a herbicide. And that way, picture a large field and there's weeds everywhere in between. If you've ever had a garden, you know how easy it is to get dandelions in between yeah, or right. any kind of weed. What this allows a farmer to do is spray their entire crop with a herbicide, but it won't impact what they're trying to grow because it's herbicide resistant. It'll kill all the weeds around it. Of course, this sounds maybe like a, a good thing in some people's eyes mm. because it's like, oh, it makes farming easier. What it actually does, though, is very, very damaging for the environment. When you look at a herbicide resistant crop, the amount of herbicides that they're using has increased exponentially because a farmer now sprays all of their crops instead of weed by weed. And so you're having all of this herbicide, this chemical, end up in the soil, in the water systems that, of course, is all interconnected. It's killing the microbes that we depend on to be able to produce healthy, safe food and really produce massive yields. And so over time, although the amount of food produced is good in the mm. beginning with GMOs, it typically starts to decline over the years because it's impacting soil health and soil is life. Soil is what provides us nutrients and our ability to grow food. So when it's not healthy, we're not healthy either. Exactly. So you say that the most farmers are using this, are using GM, GMO on the most of foods. What kind of actually the foods? How that's growing? What? No, it's not It's not all foods. It's mostly corn, canola, mm. soy, sugar from sugar beet. And then there's other crops like cotton, mm. uh, Hawaiian papaya, yellow squash and zucchini. 
And there's newer ones on the market,、uh, such as the Arctic apple. There's a genetically engineered salmon that is actually starting to be on shelves and people have access to, which is a whole scary topic about its potential impacts. And now there's new technologies called gene editing that they actually don't add foreign DNA, but、mm. they are changing the DNA of these seeds before they grow them, and they're patented by the corporations. And these are now being approved by Health Canada without any regulation, which means almost anything that we have in the supermarket is at risk of now being genetically modified. And the corporations don't have to tell farmers; they、mm. don't have to tell consumers what they're genetically modifying. So we're reaching a really scary stage in our food system、mm. that. What it does is it puts us at risk of not knowing what we're eating, but it also puts farmers at risk. And I think what a lot of people don't put into context is when a farmer is growing a seed, they usually, in the past, would historically pass seed from generation to generation. You grow a cob of corn and you save the best seeds, and you pass that on to your children over the decades,、yeah. and then they have access to seeds. That's not the case with GMOs or gene-edited crops. Now what? Corporations do is they make you sign a contract. You buy the seed year per year, along with the pesticides and herbicides. And the farmers are not allowed to save any of the seeds themselves. If they do and they replant, they can be sued.、Mm. Uh, the other thing is that if plants cross pollinate, let's say I'm an organic farmer and I'm living next to a farmer that's growing GMOs, and our our corn cross pollinates,、mm. I can be sued for stealing patent infringement. And think about. The amount of crops now that they could potentially release lot, with gene、right? editing, yeah, it's、exactly. a lot. Everything in the grocery store, and think about all those farmers that could be impacted by being sued, having their land taken away. It becomes bigger than food. It's now a human rights issue. It's a land claim issue. It's、uh, it's really bigger than all of us. So what do you have? You said about the, the regulation, right? For the government, this one is not regulated yet. But、mm -hmm. what? We saw the for GMO. We saw some package, some foods that has the label, right? Yeah. GMO. So this one, it's regulated. It's different. So when you see a package that says、uh, GMO free, GMO free.、Um, yeah. What it means is that there's actually a corporation called not a corporation, an organization called the Non GMO Project,、mm. and they're an amazing organization. If You want to learn more about GMOs? I would say they're one of the best resources you can so find. So this one is not something that is required by the government. No, no, no. So that's、yeah. an option for the company. It's the a, company it's decided to put it is like an organization that what they do is they do、uh, nonpartisan testing.、Uh, so they test all of these different products, and they let's say you you wanted to sell your product and you wanted that certification,、mm -hmm. you would have to pay for it. They'll test it for you. They'll check to see where all your ingredients come from, and then they'll certify it for you. So it's a really lengthy process to ensure that they're they're making non-GMO food available for people, and that they can actually tell what they're buying. But、mm. aside from being able to buy non-GMO food, it's really hard to tell what food has been genetically modified yeah,、exactly. in our grocery stores because Canada doesn't require labeling whatsoever. Neither does the U.S. But if you see that you tell you said that you see this process, it's very bad for the environment,、mm -hmm. right? For water, for the farmers, everything, and the. But even so, there is nothing for the government that they do it. They try to avoid or try to to regulate it, this one. There is regulation.、Nothing. There is regulation of GMO foods、uh, and GMO crops, but there's actually incentives to grow a lot of those crops. And、mm. in my eyes, a lot of that is down to lobbying of these big corporations. They do have a large hold over our government. And when you look at the crops that are most subsidized in Canada, corn, canola, and soy、yeah. are amongst the top three. And ninety percent of all three of those are genetically modified across the board. It's really hard to find organic. Soy, canola, and corn, because、mm -hmm. it is just so widely contaminated with genetically modified foods. So there's actually incentive to grow those crops, which is really sad. Versus incentivizing farmers to、That's、grow the opposite, organic. That's the opposite, right? The、exactly. incentive, yeah, should be opposite, right? Not incentive to grow in some crops like this. One would think that you'd be trying to incentivize,、uh, you know, crops that are grown that are helping pollinators or that are helping the soil, because a huge part of the pollinator decline is pesticide exposure as well. So there's really no incentive to grow healthy food. It's more just commodity crops that are used for for shipping and export around the world.、Um, a lot of these GMO crops end up in ethanol production,、mm. in、uh, use for animal feed in in these large factory farms, and they're used in our junk food production. So it's not like you and I are going out and eating genetically modified corn straight off the, the cob, like when we buy corn on the cob. It's being used in processed foods mostly. 
Um, and of course, most of the things we eat these days are processed to an extent. And the organic foods also has GMO or not? No. So if you're buying certified organic, uh, there should not be GMOs. It's not part of organic standards mm. to allow genetically modified crops. This is where it gets a little messy. Organic yeah. uh, certification only tests for pesticide exposure. So they'll test for a certain level of pesticide. And if it's over that exposure, you're not considered an organic farmer. Whereas the non-GMO project only tests for GMOs. And so if you get a certification that has both non-GMO and organic, you know you're 100% safe. Otherwise, most organic farmers are really cautious about how they grow to make sure that there's no cross-contamination. And your chances are a lot less likely to be having any GMO exposure mm. or pesticide exposure. So the ones that we see in the grocery stores, like tomatoes or some other fruit, vegetables or fruits that say organic. So I'm not safe for GMO. No, you you would be safe primarily. I, I would say you'd be across it's the more board a for lot the, As safer. you said, more for pesticides, right? It's not yes. for... But I mean, uh, part of organic standards is not allowing GMOs. So okay. I would say most farmers that are growing organic, they're going to be very cautious. I, I know a lot of organic farmers and we were talking about mm -hmm. a mutual friend of ours um, and uh, many organic farmers will actually plant many trees around the borders of their properties to try and stop pollen shift from ever mm -hmm. impacting. As of right now, there haven't been mainstream like commodity that we see in our supermarkets, like tomatoes, for instance. Yeah. So your likelihood of having GMOs is zero because there aren't really GMO tomatoes being grown um, up until now with gene editing. So that's where things change a little bit. Uh, in the past year, gene editing has been deregulated and they're going to allow it in mass uh, production, which is very scary. But Yeah, if you see organic, I would say you're considered significantly more safe. More for, yeah. for sure, right? Uh, Because we saw the news, right, Erica? You saw you said about the tomato. What? Uh, I remember that you show I, you show I, me I some see, news I about see, this. I see this this week that in Japan. I never know the Japan. Japan. Yeah. I mm. never know the pronunciation <laughs> that uh, they created the uh, tomato that is crushy GMO tomato mm -hmm. in the news said for no one buy this tomato because it's dangerous for healthy. And yeah. the, so in my, in, in my mind... But yeah. it's organic, right? They say organic or no, not? No, it's, uh, it's genetically no, modified. Yeah. Just genetic modified. Yes. Okay. And the, in, in my mind, if, uh, have the question, I think that is, is the question for many people, that if GMO is, is dangerous for water, for soil, It's dangerous for us too, because what you are eating. <laughs> yeah. For our health, right? It's it's not a good product for us to consume, even when you start giving it for the children or, or for our kids, kids, right? Yeah, and it's in so much of the foods that we... I mean, it's it's the GMOs itself that we don't have all the information. We don't know exactly what it will do to our bodies, considering it is genetically modified. There are a lot of studies that point to a variety yes. of health issues. And then it's that in combination with the pesticides and herbicides that are used so heavily. So we have such high residues of herbicides and pesticides on these grains and products that are then going into our bodies. And that's where it's concerning. I mean, if you take a look at baby formula, one of the mm. most, you know, things mm. that you should be nourishing exactly. a newborn, a sure. child. And a lot of the key ingredients are maltodextrin, which is corn um, or a soy lecithin. I mean, these are things that are primarily genetically modified, but have high pesticide residues and loads. And that's what you are putting into a newborn baby's body. And it's funny that that is the same with most children's like cereals and foods yeah. that are on the go. I mean, there's so many of the foods that we, we don't even think twice about that are filled with some really strong contaminated foods. Okay. So you see that a long time that I work with GMO, right? So How long have been... I've been an right. activist in the food movement um, or an advocate in the food movement for mm. about 12 to 13 years to now. 13 years. So since then, did you see some change or some big change since when you started to today? Or how how is the scenario right now? It's much better? Yeah. I it's think getting it's, better? I think it's actually getting worse in some really? scenarios. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. I think it was getting better for a long time. Mm. And I started when I was 11, turning 12. Um, With, with just learning about our food system. And I became really heavily involved with, in California, there was the first GMO labeling bill ever that was passed. Uh, mm. Not passed, but it was it came before the Senate and the Congress. 
Uh, it was called Prop 37, and it was all about labeling GMOs so people have the right to know what's in their food. So I got heavily involved with learning about the organizers of that, learning about how we could replicate that here, because I felt like if people had the right to know what was in their food, if, if things yeah. were labeled contains genetically modified organisms, they may choose not to buy it. And that would send a message to producers, farmers, mm. versus right now we have non-GMO um, and people want to support that, but there's no way to avoid it in any other food right? Um, unless you're only supporting organic and non-GMO. So I found that a challenge and I wanted to gain mandatory labeling. And so I was really strongly following Prop 37 and there was a lot of momentum around this movement of labeling, remove GMOs, um, try and change our food system towards healthier. And that momentum carried until there was a bill in the U.S. actually a few years back that changed so that there couldn't be mandatory labeling. It could only be voluntary and with a QR code. And a lot of people felt really disillusioned by that. And then the food movement started to shift more to focusing on positives like regenerative egg and organic agriculture. Mm. And let's focus on the solution instead of the problem. But what that allowed all of us to do is it basically gave leeway for corporations to take over in a lot of sense because we focused on the solutions and that's just as important. Yeah. But we weren't pushing against the corporations anymore. And that's how I see it in my eyes. And it's hard to fight with the corporations, right? It is. <laughs> and I hard. did it for a long time. I crashed shareholder meetings for yeah. big corporations and you push as hard as you can and you create campaigns that are with many different organizations and it's all great, but it's a challenge and it's you're pushing against a wall constantly And so what's happened since then is gene editing was deregulated in Canada and the U.S., which allows basically it is GMOs in a different mm. form to be released en masse to the public for any produce you can possibly think of. No longer regulated to the corn, canola, soy that was around for the past 20 years. And then uh, other pesticides have entered into the market. Now they're gene editing microbes, which could change the entire ecosystem of our soil, of Uh, our forests of everything. Mm. They're trying to call it a natural bio solution by genetically engineering microbes. But by doing so, I don't know if you know this, but even trees communicate through microbes in the soil, through the fungi. Yeah. Um, and by changing the microbes, you're changing the very essence of our ecosystems. And so these are the threats that are now up and coming. They're genetically engineering animals. Salmon, uh, mosquitoes were released in Florida that were genetically modified. It's starting to become a very utopian, strange world where all the food we're looking at is becoming genetically modified. Lab-made food is becoming a up-and-coming trend with uh, cell division and creating cells in labs to sell as meat. So... I think yeah. things have gotten worse in a lot of ways There in our food system. Much worse, yeah. <laughs> we know that, you know, by with technology, with everything that we are face, facing for this past year, right? People are in a rush, so want sometimes some fast food, some yeah. right. It's hard for when people, even for us, right at home. I work every uh, all the day. She's working, so sometimes for us to cook in, we go to the groceries to buy it. You know that some sometimes. Yep. It's a little bit hard and we try to find something fast to eat, right? And uh, maybe on this that the companies take advantage. Yeah, and it's people. impossible to be perfect. Because and that's that's what a lot of people ask me, like, what do you eat? And it's right? <laughs> and yeah, I think no. it's just good to be realize that we're human and ultimately like you we can never be perfect. We try our best. For example, yeah. we are we are vegan. Some people said, "Okay, you just eat salad." And yeah. No. We try to eat some uh, stuff because I think that w what we put inside our body, mm -hmm. right? It's it's and that uh, as you said, it's important to know what it contains there, what is uh, the food that I'm eating, yeah. how it's produced, what what kind of pesticides that's there, what whatever, right? So we try our best, but the companies, they try to take advantage with the, our weekly part, right? That we, we can't. I, I think the, that people need to, to know more information too, because today the people just think, I need to work, I, I need to get money, and I need to pay bills, I need, I, I need, and they forgot. When, when I, I go to grocery store, I see the people buying foods, They don't read anything. No. Put in the card. Yeah, they just da, 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 da. even expired date. They don't yeah. read the expired date. Nothing. They just yeah. put in the card oh because goodness. they're in a rush. As I thought, we we, no. we live in a rush now, we do. right? And the, what what do we, we do with us? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We humans, uh, we are crazy today. No one, no, no one take a time to to say, I, I, I may, I may uh, paranoid <laughs> because my kids had allergy mm-hmm. when I was younger, and all the time I, I look for the oh, what this contain? I, I stop it by any any product and they read it. Oh, this not I can't. This is not good. This. <laughs> But today, what yeah. I seen in the grocery store is unbelievable. Yeah, the, the people just say, "Okay, just don't take time." Oh, that, 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 that. Ten minutes is okay. Go home. Oh my goodness! And I think there's a couple of reasons behind that. I think there's people that are in a rush and live a busy yep. life, and it doesn't matter. And then there's people that can't afford anything else but what what they can afford and oftentimes yeah, that's a, that's another, that, thing, another that, thing even for for us that we said about the vegan foods right sometimes first of all it's not all the place that you find some diversity of vegan foods right you yeah. go to a groceries you find just find like four feet of the shelf yeah. with vegan food and the rest whatever you are used for but uh, we we don't have uh, even the vegan food sometimes it's expensive yeah it's more expensive than you buy some Regular foods, some meat, some. But vegan right? foods also have a problem. If you see the ingredients, is everything is like they make the laboratory. Laboratory. Yeah. 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 <laughs> for, oh exactly. my god. Exactly. It's not totally <laughs> healthy, right? It's not. See. Healthy for me in vegan is rice, beans, uh, veget- vegetables, vegetables, fruits, mm-hmm. and this. In the, I, I, the natural I, whole foods. Yes, yeah. and the, I need yeah. to know where this is, is growing. Where, yeah. how is this growing? If it, uh, there's a lot of chemicals, <laughs> this how are you eating this? Yeah. So I think that's for our future. Do you see if there is any light that we can, <laughs> <laughs> right? So maybe it's get it's getting better. You are work with this since. Uh, what, 10 years? How long? 10 years? 12, 12 years? About 12 she, years now. 12 she years. was in the COP28 last yeah. year. Yeah. Oh, how she, it was? Tell us. It was amazing. To your yeah. first question about, do you see any light? I do. Yeah. And yeah. so I'll get to COP in one sec, but I do think that... Yeah, we is, need to be confident, right? About there's some positivity everything. out yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. As much as things are negative, I also feel like when there's too much negativity, that's when people say, well, what can I do anyway? And there's no point in standing up because nothing is going to happen and it's gone too far. And so I think that at the same time that these corporations have been trying to take over, there Mm. also has been a huge shift in the food movement where people are focusing on the solutions. Mm. There are more and more farmers transitioning to organic and regenerative, as difficult as it is, because if you're a farmer that's only been growing cash commodity crops for the last, you know, three decades, or your father was a farmer doing the same thing, and that's all you've been taught, it's a complete transition to start growing food in a different way and relearn. So it is starting to happen in that way where farmers are realizing they have an impact on climate, uh, on the environment, on our food system, on pollinators, and making different choices. So that's really exciting. And I saw that also represented at COP. Um, This was one of the first COPs ever that had food systems really included in the discussion of climate and in emissions. That's good. That's nice. Because also think about um, it's not just the way it's grown, which... At the moment, our food system, because it's so destructive in the way that it's grown, is releasing carbon into our atmosphere at very high levels. But it also, transportation sector is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. And transportation is largely due to transporting food. And a lot of people don't make that connection that it's actually food that's driving that crazy amount of transport. This is another thing that you, you need to talk about because uh, we have a friend uh, in common. And the, one time she 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 posted something in social media about the garlic. She, mm-hmm. she produced the organic garlic. Yeah. Why you need to bring garlic from China? Mm-hmm. So they don't make sense. If you have the the, the, the the garlic here, why to bring it from another country make a lot of impact in the in the environment? Yeah, it's it has a huge impact. And it, food systems in general, I mean, we know factory farming is incredibly intensive and destructive for our earth. It's the offsets of our climate, but it's also the pollution and the runoff that goes into our lakes and our water and everything else. We see the incredible amount of algae blooms that are happening in our freshwater bodies. So it's all deeply interconnected. And I felt that that was 
really represented at COP for the first time. Mm. Of course, there was also the other side of like the bigger corporations representing themselves at COP too and talking about lab grown meat and not, you know, not investing in regenerative egg, only growing food in vertical spaces and indoors. And I do think there's something to be said for really nourishing our earth and our soil and going back to the roots of how we are supposed to live with our earth and our ecosystems and not feeling so separate from it. And there are many corporations that are really trying to advocate almost for that separation of not knowing where food comes from, growing it in a lab, being separate mm -hmm. from the natural processes of our our being, because we are part of nature. We're not meant to be separate from it. So uh, that's something that I did see that's more on the negative side of COP, but you're going to see a mixture of opinions and a mixture of ideas. So you take what you can from it. And uh, I was lucky enough to speak on a variety of different issues happening mm -hmm. as well about the issue of there's genetically modified trees now being released uh, and grown and the impacts that that could have on our forest systems worldwide. So I, I felt very honored to be there and to be able to talk about some That's of those issues. That's very nice. Andy, <clears throat> it's something, Andy, there, did you see that uh, which country we have the most problem with this or because Canada has the same thing, Canada, US, right? Because they grow so a lot of foods with GMO, everything. How about other countries? Did you see any scenario there or? North America is the biggest producer of it's genetically biggest, modified. Right. Um, now, there are other countries that do grow genetically modified foods or industrialized foods. Uh, Europe does still have, you know, pesticide use and a variety mm -hmm. of issues. And, I mean, there are GMO foods being grown around the world. But in terms of the way the farming is done, Canada and the U.S. are, are large producers. Brazil and Argentina also have a, a large issue with genetically modified soy. And actually, the Amazon destruction is a huge part of the use of genetically modified soy, which is then shipped globally and mm -hmm. primarily yeah. used for factory farming. For farmers there, right? Yeah. yeah. That's very... Andy, you have a foundation. Yeah. I would like to know about this foundation. What do you do? Sure. Yeah. So I started this organization uh, around 2012. And basically at the time, it was all about mandatory GMO labeling, gaining the right to know what's in our food. And then talking about all of these subsective issues that come with GMOs, so the impacts on our soil and our water, use of pesticides. And I feel that's really grown over the years. Now we talk about a lot of different issues from human rights and labor issues in our food system. Uh, we talk about GMOs, gene editing, uh, all the chemicals that are in use, climate change. I mean, we've really expanded, but everything is deeply interconnected with our food system. Because if you track any big issue back, a lot of the time... There is some interconnection with our food. Yeah. So we've we've been talking about all of those intersections. And then we also um, we have campaigns that we run uh, frequently. Again, a lot of it is surrounded in you know, GMOs and pesticides was always a huge part of our conversation and what we wanted to teach kids. So we do focus a lot on youth, people of all ages. But youth has always been something that I was young in this movement. And we wanted to teach other young people about what is in your food, how to read these ingredients. So we'll yeah, go to right. schools and teach about that, teach about like what is maltodextrin and what is high fructose corn syrup and um, what does that translate to on an environmental impact about pollinators. And then now we actually run a, a community garden. So, so nice. it's, yeah, it's located in Richmond Hill, mm -hmm. uh, Ontario. And so if anyone listening wants to come and visit, <laughs> they're welcome no, to. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and uh, We live in Richmond Hill. Oh, do you? Okay, yeah, come yeah, out. Yeah, we are never there. <laughs> That's great. Where is located? Uh, it's located, I'm not sure if you know where the Bayview Community Center is, but it's right across the street. It's Spadina and, oh my gosh, I'm, why am I not remembering this? Spadina and Weldrick? Hmm. Uh, I, I believe. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's it's close by. And um, it's it's been an amazing process. This is our technically third year coming up. But the first year we were in another location in Richmond Hill and the city really liked what we were doing. So the city of Richmond Hill granted us space in a park and they said, take it, grow what you would like to. So we brought out about 60 volunteers, primarily young people mm. in our first really big year last year. And we grew thousands of pounds of food and we donated it to local food banks for People so that yeah it. couldn't necessarily afford produce. No, definitely we're gonna do, gonna go there. Yeah, we're absolutely. And all volunteers are welcome. Like we mm -hmm. we love having people come out, and we're actually just starting the planting year, so we're getting nervous and excited <laughs> at the same time. Right. The city really enjoyed it, and they actually granted us more space even this year. So 
looking forward to seeing what comes out of that. But we we want to teach young people. And I think the most rewarding part of that, of having a hands-on space, was seeing not only everything grow and become beautiful and seeing community from neighbors that never spoke to each other to now coming yeah, together right. and having a, a hub. And then the kids that were coming in didn't really communicate at first and were quiet and mm -hmm. they didn't know each other because we're just coming out of two years or three years of the COVID and pandemic times yeah. and people were at home. They couldn't go to school. We had new immigrants that had never really gotten a chance to meet anybody. So they come to this country and they were lonely. And now uh, over the growing season, which is fairly short, unfortunately, they all became like a community and they were meeting with each other and wanting to be in the garden, even if we weren't there to volunteer, it was just wanting to mm -hmm. spend time. And time to talk, yeah. right? Yeah. To in share nature, information. Exactly. Yeah, that's amazing. It was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And for kids, it's is, is very good to experience that. And the, about the kids, what you, what do you see when they, they, we, are, we are talking about the growing, the food, the chemicals, what, what the, the, the reaction the kids I think it was excitement and I felt it too. I mean, it was really easy for me in like a very honest way before the garden. I was in a space where I was almost lacking that excitement for our world um, and and not feeling that same joy that I felt before the pandemic. And I feel like a lot of people felt like that. It was just lack of separation and uh, sorry, big separation and isolation and feeling like you don't know people anymore and the world changed and in a very small way, I felt that um, I gained my excitement and joy back for living and life and our earth and the environment. But I saw that in everybody else, too, because it's something that when you reconnect with our earth and you're doing something as mundane as planting a seed, um, there is an excitement to go back and see how much it's grown. And um, not only the volunteers, but we had people that lived in the community for over 30 years and said they never spoke to anybody, not their neighbors, no one once. And now they're like, they have a place that they're meeting. We had couples that were going to pray there in the morning and have like morning meditations together. And it's it's a community that wanted to then see how much this was going to grow. And then everybody grew around it as well. We had people taking photos of it every single day to create a time lapse to see nice. how much everything grew. And it's just that excitement of, of saying that it's, not on your phone it's not technology yeah. it's not work it's just something different than than the everyday routine which is really nice have you think to bring this to the schools i would love to the only problem right. that i encounter here mm. is that our growing season for outdoors is so short that by the time school starts yeah. everything starts to die so it almost would have to be indoors uh, because most teachers can't go during the summer to take care of it at the schools mm. but what our idea was this year is to actually go to the schools and ask them if they would start to plant the seedlings in February. And so now I'm working with a couple of students and they can grow the seedlings. And then when it's time to plant, they can bring them from the school and be a part of planting it so they can be a part of the very first step of of creating the garden, which I think is a good alternative to the upkeep over That's the summer. Amazing. Schools for me, it's amazing. That's yeah. a totally different something like you go to the school and just learn math, geography, and that's it. That's something that it, it's bring. For example, you start with 11, right? Yeah. I mean, my daughter is 13 now. And uh, we see that they needed to learn about this kind of thing as well, 100%. right? About the environment, how to protect, what happened with the water, if it's contaminated, yeah. right? Not just math, okay? Math is important. I think. <laughs> okay, I have to say that's important, okay? <laughs> Cut. I just use the calculator. <laughs> Man, you know. <laughs> it's, it's because sometimes uh, we, we talk at home and uh, we think, okay, if something happens tomorrow and uh, no more internet, no more schools, no more, what these children will do? Yeah. They, they don't know. They don't know how to put a fire the water they yeah. don't know how to grow to your survive, food right? they can. <laughs> well and especially we live in a cold country i mean if something happens in the winter power goes out it's not an unrealistic exactly thought. okay we don't maybe know. maybe we say oh it's never happened maximum one or two days but man we don't know, we don't we, know who it... knows exactly it's Why all happened? unknown <laughs> right and we don't have those basic skills anymore of even growing food a lot yes. of people basic skill. exactly i've i've had kids that i've gone to speak at schools and they didn't realize that they could save the seeds out of a tomato that they're eating mm -hmm. from the supermarket and it's those 
those things that I see as basic because I, I've sort of researched and grown up around it. But had I not, I may not have made that connection either that what I'm eating has seeds that can produce the next generation yes. of food for me. And I simply have to save it and dry it out. And next year I have a whole thing of cucumbers or tomatoes. It's, it's, it's like the trees. Sometimes the people, okay, you shut down, you shut down the tree and we plant the tree. That's okay. Oh my yeah. goodness. How, how, how long it takes to grow. Yeah. 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 In, in my in my case I, I teach my children inside my home I have four baby trees <laughs> four or five yeah I know it's like a jungle inside <laughs> it's almost <laughs> because I teach my, but usually my, my daughter all the time is stay with me and the, I take the seeds I plant and she now uh, I don't know that they say oh the tree is taller than you <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a big exactly. one exactly <laughs> and the, uh, sometimes I say oh, but see The, the big parts of the children don't have this experience. Yeah. And this is very important for children. It is. And it's up to the parents to teach them too, because yeah. I think a lot of parents also have lost connection. I I know many people who grow their own gardens, but I also know many parents that have, don't go outside or aren't outside yeah. often, and it's not a priority in in what their children learn. But it's something that we all have to learn together because I think generationally we've lost that wisdom and that knowledge and many people have held on to it but i'd say people who live in cities people who are a little bit more disconnected from being mm -hmm. close to nature have oftentimes lost that that connection to it and um their ability to understand how they can be yeah. a part of it or grow their own food or even their own herbs on their balcony i mean it's not like you have yeah. to have land you can grow things and you know what's very interesting when you we had the other uh, company sets remember that we yeah. we started going to the schools It's like we're doing some like puppet shows for yeah, yeah. kids for grade one, grade two, right? And the, it was something very interesting that the kids bring home all the information that they had during the school, right? Because sometimes with the kids, they don't talk with parents about environment, right? No. Nobody goes to, kids goes to the home, back, back home. Oh, the environment today, it was, no. They no. talk about math, geography, what it, they learn. So once they learn something different, They bring it home and start asking for the parents about environment, mm. about food, right? We yeah. did a puppet show, uh, show about uh, eating health, right? So as you said, most of the kids doesn't know that you can take the seeds, you can grow grow with the seeds, right? What to use. So this is very powerful. School is very powerful to change our future. It is. And But I... it's hard to start it. It is. And every teacher is different too. And that's... Unless it's, you know, part of a curriculum that's built in, a lot of teachers don't have interest or, or don't have time or a struggle mm -hmm. to, to incorporate it. But I agree that school is a huge impact. And I, I think part of why I was fascinated by a young age is I actually had a teacher that every year would get us to plant sunflower seeds because she had a garden. Mm -hmm. And so for her, it was like she would take the sunflowers mm -hmm. to be a part of her garden. Um, but we got to watch the growing process of, of these tiny little seeds transforming into something massive and her garden was was close it was almost part of our, our yard so we got to see it and just the way that they would tower above us and it becomes a completely different life of its own you you feel connected to that you start to realize yeah. oh my gosh this seed has life mm -hmm. it's it's beyond just something that you could eat a sunflower seed but it it grows into something really magnificent and so if if kids were taught that i was so fascinated i'd go check every day because The amount that it grows in a day is absolutely incredible. It's and nice. If, I remember when I was young, when I was in the school, right? Very grade one, grade two, that uh, we put in a, like a cup exactly. with uh, cotton yep. and the bean. bean. And they grow right? so fast. And they grow so fast. After two to three days, you see that. And, yeah. my, and I remember the next day, I was very excited to go to there <laughs> and see, hey, let's yeah. see how is it growing. And that's that excitement that I'm talking about. Like right. Most, Most young people don't realize it, but it's innately in us to be curious yeah. and excited to see how something is constantly changing. Yeah, I, because, I don't like the way that for the schools today, that's just put like kids like you go here. You have to learn. uniform. You have mm. uniform, you have to learn math, you have to learn this. You have, man, come on. Yeah. And then I do, I, and the, 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 suddenly you, you ask for the children, where are you, where are you from your tomatoes? Yeah. The, the for, grocery. For the grocery. That's easy, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, it, that, that, it's hard. I think we, we have a uh, hard job from our foods, right? So how to eat health, right? You see that you are 
who worked with this for more than 10 years. And the, it's not a good improvement since then, right? We see, maybe we think that's like crazy because sometimes we saw even in cartoons or movies, the car they get a pill, put in the plate, put a water, yeah. the food is growing <laughs> right now, right? From the pills or the capsules. So uh, what, do you f what do you see in the future? How do you, you are confident with our food in the future for 10, 20, 30 years from now? I think that there's always going to be in simplistic terms, like, good and, and bad that continuously conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. And there's there's the corporations that, of course, profit driven and there's always going to be yeah, big profits. profits. Is, yeah, it's but money. We it's, cannot, we cannot, yeah. uh, unfortunately, that's something that we cannot run away. But And that's right? always been a driving force in, in yeah. our world and lobbying exists and big corporations will continue pushing their own agendas because Absolutely. it's the bottom line. And I can only hope that the organizations that are, are larger than mine because ours is small we try our very best to do mm -hmm. what we can and so our our campaigns are on a bigger level but our work with with young people for now is in one location and so it's not like we're the biggest organization but i can hope that others that have more reach and more power mm -hmm. that we can all bind together and that we can push against what's going on right now because uh collaboration in this time where we're all very separate is more important now than ever and so i have hope that that there is good in humanity and that there's still good people fighting for regenerative agriculture that's become right. a huge movement. And there's still people fighting for organics and healthy food for all. And that's where the hope lies, that that ultimately nature is telling us the solutions. And we really just have to listen to that and be in tune with that and, and protect it at all costs because we're part of nature and without it, our lives will be very, very different. Right. You are here, right? Uh, do you have a kid? Do you you said, do you have kids? No, no I, I'm not yet. <laughs> I'm young oh. still. <laughs> <laughs> so, about your experience with children, okay? Uh, which message you you can give for the parents about the the children's with nature about the growing food? I think just start with your kids experimenting. Like you have seeds if if you're eating produce of any kind and you're in your fridge start experimenting and it doesn't have to be a lot but yeah. take a couple of the seeds out of the tomato and and plant it with your kids and just watch the excitement and interest in the summer you can look into getting monarch eggs and caterpillars and and learning about that process of metamorphosis and that's a really great way to learn about pollinators and why we should be protecting pollinators and planting milkweed in your backyard to protect pollinators and and bees planting the right flowers for them. And there's all these little things that, that we can do that are teachable moments, but that also don't take a lot of effort in our own lives. Uh, this is free, yeah, right? good. Yeah. yeah, you're reusing things that you already have. Like if mm -hmm. you if you see in a field there's there's milkweed, you can always take a plant and bring one home to your own yard and or take the seeds from that and bring those seeds to your own yard. Or uh, if, you, if you don't have a lot of space, you can buy herb seeds or you can yeah, right. use tomato seeds you already have from a tomato or a cucumber or a pepper. I mean, a lot of the things that we buy as produce, they they are giving us the seeds if we want to use them. Yeah, so right. um, it's at our dispense. Perfect. I think, uh, I think I hope everybody learned a little bit about the G <laughs> GMO. Right, I'm thinking yeah. GMP. <laughs> oh my god! I'm still thinking GMP. <laughs> Gotta get that one out. <laughs> yeah, so get out of here. <laughs> and G, how the people can contact you? Well, your organization. Yeah, so our organization is called Kids Right to Know. We have a website called uh, www.kidsrighttoknow.com. Um, and all of our contact information is on our website. It's a website, right? Yeah, yeah, and we also go through all the different issues that we not always have campaigns on, but that we talk about and that we're passionate about. So we have child labor in, in issues like cocoa production and coffee production. We go through issues like climate change, regenerative agriculture, fertilizer use. Like we, mm -hmm. we list all of it. So I really encourage beyond what I mentioned about, you know, parents teaching your kids how to plant, go through our website and learn more information about where your food is coming from because uh, our disconnection from our food is what has led us to this this point where our food is under attack, our food systems un are under attack. And the more people have knowledge on where our food comes from, the more you can connect with that, 
the better chance that we all have on on fighting some of these big issues that we're facing. So just educate yourself and try and make choices in the supermarket that you believe match you to the best of your abilities. And yeah, I know right. it's not always possible, but if we all try and make little changes when we can, yeah. uh, then it does make a big change. Perfect. One, one thing that she, she, know, she told mm. now that she remember about the child is child labor um, yeah yeah labor in the in the farm is mm. uh, it's a here, huge issue this is a problem here in canada you don't have this we don't have it uh as much of what we know of but there have even been cases in the u.s where they say that it doesn't happen where farmers were hiring underage children to work in the fields and oh It's also happening with companies that we're buying and supporting from all the time. There was a huge thing with Nestle and Hershey's using child labor yeah, right. to produce cocoa. Um, and then we buy from those companies and we don't think about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, children are used in a lot of those as well as palm oil. And I mean, mineral production, it's it's pretty expansive as to where children are used in our supply chain. Uh, This, but food especially. The, the palm oil is a big problem with many things. I sometimes the, the vegan has a chocolate. I don't know. I I don't say the name because <laughs> a big brand. Don't ever don't want, everyone knows. But see, they produce now the vegan mm -hmm. chocolate. Mm -hmm. they, ah, ah, now I have the, the chocolate. But see, in the chocolate, they contain palm oil. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of problems be, behind the palm oil. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge problem in the. The disaster that it causes, I mean, it's it's similar to even, as I mentioned, the soy and the Amazon. It's soy and palm oil that are, are yeah. primarily in, they're burning down the forest in order to grow it. So it is a huge problem supply-wise, um, but that's why if we're conscious, if we know where it's coming from, we can make better choices. And how are you supposed to make good choices if you don't know what is going on yes. in our food supply? So. It's not to make anyone feel bad. It's not to pressure you to change everything no, in your life no, immediately. No. It's But, just to say, like, we all have power in our yeah. decisions. And that's a positive thing. It doesn't have to yes. be a negative thing. And do you, we are 8 billion people. Yeah. You can imagine if we, the small information we, you we spread, you can cause the big impact in the world. Absolutely. And especially living in, in North America. I mean, there are many countries that are less advantaged in many ways or that are primarily producing and so we're extracting constantly from these these countries that oftentimes it's one of the the biggest producers for their economy um, and so the way that we consume really impacts many other places in the world as well and if we continue to consume palm oil or cocoa and in, in the same way or soy or canola or any of these other things that are, are produced often at the expense of local communities um, then we have a say in in what's going on as well and that's Again, it can seem negative, like, oh, if I do this, I'm supporting this. But yeah. there's power in, in knowing that because we can make a slightly different choice if that's yeah. possible. I know not everyone is in the same situation, but if people that do have that ability to make changes made changes in their lives, it would have a huge change. Absolutely. That's it. Information. That's yeah. what they're very important. That's why we are here. Yeah. <laughs> to bring information. Right. And you exactly. learn a lot today. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> you know about many things that she told to us today. <laughs> yeah, so, I think that's it, right, Erica? Yeah, I yeah think glad it, you have helped. <laughs> yeah, so I think we learn, I think, no, I'm pretty sure that we learn a lot here and people that uh, never heard about uh, GMO, I'm pretty sure that many people doesn't know about this and uh, now has something that they can think when they're going to buy uh they gro go to the groceries to buy their food right maybe yeah. they can read the labels or see something and or if, searching the internet search, for the yeah. there are so many great resources, yeah. so many great resources. our yeah. website there's a uh, canadian biotechnology action network there's uh the non-gmo project like mm -hmm. all of there's so much out there those three are really yeah. good places to start and then you can great, go from there and And find more information, and you can follow us on our, our social media platforms as well, which you can find through our website. So Yeah, exactly. So people that want more information or have some doubts about our conversation today, Rachel has the Instagram, right? The yeah. website. Can you say again your website? Sure. It's www.kidsrighttoknow.com. 
Perfect. You can go there. So many information that is good, right? Right. Okay. And also, you can see in the Green Vibes podcast, www.thegreenvibes. The the yeah, thegreenvibes.ca. The it's right there. Right? See? <laughs> Just read over there. <laughs> Who is watching the YouTube, you can read it there. Who is not, I'm going to say again, www.thegreenvibes.ca. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, again. Thank you so much. I'm happy to have been here. Amazing, amazing conversation. I love it. Thank you very much, <laughs> Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.